Do you want to maximize your success with NCUA? Join Mark Trichel as he shares with you the insider's view on passing your exam with Flying Colors. The With Flying Colors podcast is sponsored by Credit Union Exam Solutions by Mark Trichel. If you would like to work directly with the Credit Union Exam Solutions team and receive support to optimize your results with NCUA so you save time and money, visit us at marktrichel.com to find out more. Hey everyone, this is Mark Treichel with another episode of With Flying Colors. I am recording this on March 12th, going to publish this Monday morning. And this is again about the ramification of Silicon Valley Bank or SVB being shut down. I'm going to talk about how that might impact NCUA, what NCUA might do, and how that might impact you as a credit union. So NCUA, what now? Because of SVP Bank. But first, a lot has hit the news since I recorded the podcast that published on Sunday. And there was uh, there's some tweets out there that uh, President Biden is saying there will be no bailout. There are some tweets out there that say Janet Yellen is saying there will be no bailout. Janet Yellen was on the news shows this mor- morning to help efforts to ensure that contagion doesn't happen. And I'll go into that a little bit. And these are all precursors of just the news that's hit in the last couple hours. And then I'll jump into the main topic, which is NCUA. What now? I've also heard and seen some tweets that, as I mentioned in my previously recorded podcast, there's no doubt FDIC and the Fed is trying to sell some assets this weekend. And if they do that, they turn it into cash. That cash quickly can be paid out or more quickly can be paid out to the uninsured depositors. All of that is good. There's also a new article on the Wall Street Journal that says regulators face urgent tasks to stem spread from Silicon Valley Bank. And Janet Yellen, there's a quote from Janet Yellen, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. It says, I've been working all weekend with our banking regulators to design appropriate policies to address this situation. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said in an interview on Face the Nation on CBS, she didn't provide specifics to those plans. We want to make sure that the troubles that exist at one bank don't create contagion to others that are sound. We are concerned about depositors and are focused on trying to meet their needs. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy said that he had discussed the issue with Ms. Yellen and Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell and that he was hopeful that the officials would be able to announce their next steps later on Sunday. They do have tools to handle the current situation, Mr. McCarthy said on Fox News' Sunday Morning Futures. They do know the seriousness of this and they are working to try to come forward with some announcement before the market opens. I'm hopeful something can be announced today. So again, I've also heard that some bank sale information may happen before the Asian markets open up. And all right, so there's a lot of work going on at federal agencies over the weekend. I'm anticipating that some folks at NCUA may be doing some number crunching as well. So that gets me to, okay, what happens now at NCUA? So the NCUA has a board meeting on Thursday. It's a light, light agenda. There's only one item and it's the subordinated debt final rule. I think they're tweaking it as it relates potentially to ESIP and some other things that they've proposed under that. So that's a good rule, but that's all that's on the agenda. I'm expecting that NCUA board chairman Todd Harper will open up and discuss what happened at BB Bank and what that means for credit unions. I think he, when he does that, he will take it as another opportunity to say that Congress needs to provide more flexibility and make changes to the rule around the CLF, also known as the Central Liquidity Facility, because there were some laws that were in place under the pandemic that expired that made it harder for smaller credit unions to be counted in equations that increased the multiplier and made it easier for NCUA and the CLF to have a higher available borrowing capacity. And I would agree with what I think Chairman Harper and the full board will probably say that those flexibilities, it would be great. And 
as they often say, don't let any good crisis go to waste. And while this is a crisis, and I believe the contagion will be mitigated, it's a good opportunity for NCUA to explain why credit unions need a little bit more assistance via potentially via the, the CLF. And who knows, maybe ultimately something along those lines will happen. So what is going to happen next? I believe that, as I mentioned in the last podcast, that B Silicon Valley Bank had about 80% of their shares in uninsured shares, which is a huge number that I've never seen before. I did do some of my own analysis, pulling information off of Callahan's database, which by the way is fantastic. I looked at any credit union that was over a billion in assets at the end of the year. And on average, the credit unions that are over a billion dollars in assets has roughly, where's my stats here? They, the, so the highest percentage credit union is under, let, let's just say rounding under 40% of uninsured shares, which is less than half of the situation at SVB. So while it's an outlier for credit unions, it's not, again, it's just half of what SVB was at. Now that's a pretty high number. I'm sure that credit union is probably taking a look at what they can do liquidity wise and what they can do risk management wise. The average of $1 billion credit unions is 9.9%. So 9.9% on average collectively of Credit union deposits are in uninsured shares at the billion plus category. If a credit union over a billion plus is at roughly 16%, they are in the top 10 percentile as far as credit unions. Um, when laid end to end, they're in the top 10% of credit unions with concentrations in uninsured uninsured shares. So I would imagine NCUA, if they haven't started looking at it already, will be looking at that. I will tell you, I don't think this has been given much of an exam focus historically. If you have a lot of them, it might be something that a capital market specialist of uninsured shares, them is uninsured shares. Capital market specialists might have raised it. They might ask you to be cognizant of it in your risk management planning for your liquidity. But I will assure you that this will become a bigger exam focus moving forward. There's really no choice but for it to be, and I'm sure that's what the FDIC will start doing at banks. So the fire drill going on at FDIC relative to this, I'm sure there'll be a fire drill at NCUA relative to this. And also, so the third point I want to make is, I've talked about this a lot, NCUA's recent letter to credit unions had priority number one as liquidity risk. And as it relates to liquidity risk, uh, the, letter, the letter said higher interest rates have caused a slowdown in prepayments for some loans and investment holdings, which has resulted in reduced cash flows, large increases in share balances from 2022 may result in an increased level of share sensitivity and share roll-off as market rates continue to rise. In evaluating the L component of the CAMELS rating to determine the adequacy of your credit union's liquidity risk management framework, examiners will consider the current and prospective sources of liquidity compared to funding needs. Examiners will review your credit union's liquidity policies, procedures, and risk limits. Examiners will also evaluate the adequacy of your credit union's liquidity risk management framework relative to the size, complexity, and risk profile of your credit union. Examiners will assess liquidity management by evaluating the potential effects of changing interest rates on the market value of assets and borrowing capacity. Scenario analysis for liquidity risk modeling, including possible member share migrations. Scenario analysis for changes in cash flow projections for an appropriate range of relevant factors, for example, changing prepayment speeds. The appropriateness of contingent funding plans to address implaus any plausible unexpected liquidity shortfalls. Okay, what one word did I not say that they will have in your liquidity risk assessment? There's no reference to uninsured shares. And as I said, that's not something that has been a material focus unless there was such an outlier situation that a particular examiner may have provided some advice to a credit union. I fully expect that NCUA, if they haven't already started thinking about this, will soon be thinking about a new letter to credit unions specifically on liquidity risk that addresses 
uninsured shares. That's my prediction. So number one, Harper's going to speak about this being a priority. Harper's going to speak about the CLF and needing more flexibility there. I think as soon as Thursday, they may say that there's a new letter to credit unions coming out. And again, I'm basing this just based on my 33 years at NCUA, having been working as executive director with the board, having been a regional director, having supervised the regional directors in the Office of Examination of Insurance. These are the things I would be saying and doing and thinking about if I was still at NCUA, which is why I'm predicting that is what they will do. All right. So camels on liquidity, you know, just in the nick of time, what, a year ago, NCUA changed camel to camels and liquidity is now isolated as its own camel rating and sensitivity has been separated. I thought I would walk through what the camel ratings are to liquidity. And if you get a code one in liquidity, it, the credit union, the, the definition of that is the credit union will have has well-developed funds management policies and practices. The credit union has reliable access to sufficient sources of funds on favorable terms to meet present and anticipated liquidity. What's a code two? A code two is the credit union has satisfactory liquidity levels. The credit union has adequate funds management policies and practices, and the credit union has access to sufficient sources of funds on acceptable terms to meet present and and anticipated liquidity needs. So that third bullet is the same for both a one and a two, and they drop the uh, management policies and practices to adequate from well-developed. So you're code one, you have well-developed funds management policies. You're a code two, you have adequate funds management policies. If you're a code three, you can guess it's going to be less less acceptable words. And it says that the credit union has low liquidity levels and the credit union's funds management policies and practices are not fully commensurate with its size and complexity or the liquidity risks it has taken. And the credit union may lack ready access to funds on reasonable terms. So any one of those three things pops up and you may get a code three in liquidity. Code four, the the credit union has inadequate liquidity levels. The credit union's funds management policies and practices are inadequate given its size and complexity. And the credit union is likely not to be able to obtain sufficient funds on reasonable terms to meet liquidity needs. Of course, the dreaded camel code five in liquidity, which by the way, had there been an exam Friday at Silicon Valley Bank, they would have gotten a five. But what happens oftentimes in liquidity, it goes from zero to 60 real quick. But the definition of a code five in liquidity is that the liquidity levels are so deficient, there is eminent threat to the credit union's viability. The credit union requires extraordinary external financial assistance to meet mature maturing obligations or other liquidity needs. By the way, I've often said on these podcasts, and by the way, we have a lot of liquidity-based podcasts on here that I've done with Todd Miller, but I've said liquidity only matters and doesn't matter until it matters, and then it's the only thing that matters. It's like oxygen. Once you can't breathe, you notice how quickly that becomes a problem. And That's what happened at Silicon Valley Bank, and the banking industry wants to try and mitigate that, stop this from becoming contagious. The good news, uh, if there is good news, is that if the asset quality is as good as what I'm hearing some people proclaim, those assets can quickly be turned into cash. That cash can then be returned to the uninsured shareholders who will get closer and closer to being made whole every time that there's a dividend paid to those uninsured shareholders. All right, so next up, where do I see NCUA going? So there's the CYA effect, cover your you-know-what. What's the risk-reward right now with all of this going on? And if I'm right with more guidance coming out with examiners negotiating Pick a word, nicely, reasonably. What's the risk reward for them bending and being more flexible? Odds are, if you have a very experienced examiner and a very experienced capital market specialist, you might might be able to get some reasonable treatment if you're falling into that between a two and a three category, which is where a lot of credit unions that have been borrowing and have been growing and have been leveraging, are going to find themselves having discussions between the two category and the three category. 
in, in the world we're living in right now. Ty might go to the runner generally when things are going well, meaning you might get a two here where Ty might not go to the runner and the proverbial umpire in this situation will call you out and you might find yourself getting put towards a document resolution as opposed to an examiner finding, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm expecting NCUA, while prior, liquidity was already priority one, it's going to be one, two, and three, and you can expect to focus on this quite a bit. There's also, I think, the underwater investment situation that many credit unions have had. I believe that they will try and get an even better grip and their arms around this better. And you could see potentially an increased focus on this. By the way, I'm saying all this also while NCUA is still trying to become fully staffed with the great resignation that everybody is battling right now. NCUA continues to battle that. So they have the resources that they have. A lot of their examiners have not faced crisis before. I want to say it's at least 50, probably 60, 65 percent of NCUA examiners were not around in 2008 and 2009 when the last crisis hit. So that puts them in the inexperienced category that probably puts them in the less comfortable and less willing to negotiate things. What else might we see? So net economic value, income simulations. Remember, NCUA changed their requirement that, well, they eliminated extreme on the NEV scale. Previously, if you were rated extreme, you had to get a document of resolution requiring you to put a plan in place to deleverage. They eliminated extreme, but some credit unions are still getting those plans put in place based on examiner judgment. Well, while I'm telling you what's going on now, the my anticipation is the examiner judgment in some instances will be a little harsher. And again, the negotiation efforts are going to be crucial for you to make sure that you can explain why you are safe and sound and why you do have the capabilities of, say, a CAMEL liquidity score of two or code of two. All right. So the other thing I wanted to mention is I was getting some chatter from some friends in the industry about how SVB, a Silicon Valley bank, was tied to some payment systems that and some QSOs and different things. And that as early as Friday, the credit unions were becoming aware of that and some changes were being made on how routing would work. So credit unions were moving quickly, but there are a lot of systems that may have links. They may not necessarily be critical systems as defined by the credit unions. But I know that these are issues that are out there. I also know that NCOA is taking a look at that. And along those lines, you can probably expect to see NCUA communicate some things uh, along those lines. All right. So I also had a good friend point out to me that they are hearing that that BEC, business email compromise, is something that you might see more things happening right now. And I've heard that's been hitting some credit unions already, but with with chaos of a lot of people changing banks right now this is a type of phishing phishing activity as i understand it where they actually try and attack within the credit union and a definition of a business email compromise is a type of email cybercrime scam in which an attacker targets a business to defraud the company business email compromise is a large and growing problem that targets organizations of all sizes across every industry around the world and some of the biggest companies in the world have been hit by this. So this is where they would make it look like the CEO is telling you to do something and to wire funds and to close accounts. And it's really fraudulent actors that could end up defunding you or, or, or excuse me, that could end up um, defrauding the credit union. And if you find yourself having a lot of volume and a lot of discussion relative to this, it's easier to make mistakes when things are moving quickly. So it's just something that you need to be aware of. It's possible that NCUA could be coming out with some warnings on that and or the FDIC doing something similar. All right. So those are the things I think is probably on the top of the list for how this is going to impact NCUA and accordingly the trickle down. Of course, it flows down towards and towards the credit union when NCUA acts. Those are my predictions of what I see coming in the short term and mid range. Again, a lot going on on this topic and I may have a daily podcast 
over the next week, if it makes sense to do so as things um, hit the press, hit NCUA's releases, et cetera, et cetera. All right, that's it. I hope you found this episode helpful. A lot going on here, and I think your jobs just got tougher out there in credit union land. This is Mark Treichel signing off with Flying Colors. Thank you for joining us on this episode of With Flying Colors. Subscribe on your favorite podcast app to hear future episodes where subject matter experts of all varieties will provide tips on how to achieve success with NCUA. If you would like to learn more about how we assist credit unions, check out our services at marktreichel.com. 